We hope you'll be blessed and inspired and challenged and motivated by this fresh word from Christian Heritage Church. So this morning we're continuing the message on being positioned by God. We understand that when we come to Jesus Christ, when He saves us, delivers us, He positions us in His kingdom. He positions us to be effective in His kingdom. Now, so often we think that Christianity is just about coming to church, reading the Bible, praying occasionally, but I've got news for you, it's a whole lot more than that. If that's the scope of your relationship with Jesus, you haven't even scratched the surface. There is so much that God wants to do in you and through you, you would be amazed by what He really has planned. So let's look at the scripture this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verses 1 through 4. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Father, now let the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit change lives in this room. Lord, I pray that you would convict us as believers and help us to understand you have positioned us for more than just coming to church. Help us, Lord, be passionate by the things that you are passionate about. Help us to be burdened by the things that you are burdened about. Help us, Father, to sense the heart of God in this room and desire to be a part of what you're doing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we have correlated it with Joshua from the Old Testament. We've already talked about the fact that because Joshua understood his assignment, his position, he lived and walked in authority, and he was extremely courageous. Three times or four times, actually, in Joshua chapter 1, God told Joshua to be strong and courageous. Listen, if you're going to live an overcoming Christian life in this culture, in this society, you better have some courage. You better be a man or a woman who has some sand in your craw and who can stand when things get tough. You better understand God has positioned you and filled you with courage so that you can stand against the wiles and the attacks of the enemy. So he was courageous. Then last week we started talking about the fact that he was dependable or faithful. And every one of us have a responsibility to be faithful where God has placed us. So many times we see someone else doing something else and we say, no, I want to do that. And we step out of our position, we step out of our assignment, we step out of God's authority over our life, and we don't do what God's called us to do. We circumvent God's plan. Can I challenge you this morning? It doesn't matter what your assignment is. Stay where God has placed you. Do what God has called you to do. Be the man or the woman that God has infused you with the Holy Spirit to be and to become. Now, there are things in the kingdom I understand I can't do. I look at Miss Keturah. She loves children. Man, it was all I could do to love my own children some days, let alone everybody else's. I understand she loves them. She wants to work with them. She wants to disciple them, bring them to Christ. That's where God has positioned her, but he didn't put me there. I look at Gary, and Gary spends his life on a motorcycle. I love to ride motorcycles, but I don't have God, Gary's assignment up on my life. I have to understand God's assignment for me. Stop looking at everybody else and think, I want to do what they're doing. No, ask God, what is it you want me to do? What is your assignment for my life? Then step into it. Be faithful, be dependable, and watch how God flows with anointing and flows with authority to accomplish his purposes in and through your life. But if you don't understand your assignment, you'll never live in that place of authority and anointing. So I'm challenging you today to be where you're supposed to be. Some of you need to be working with the kids. Some of you need to be here on Thursdays with the food pantry, serving those hundreds of people who come through and get fresh food every single week. You need to be helping that. Some of you need to be serving in men's ministries or women's ministries. Some of you need to be serving the helpless and the homeless. Some of you need to be serving in the veteran community right alongside Colonel Washington. Come on, find the position God has for you and stand there. 
Be faithful in it. Do what God has called you to do and watch what God will do. Acts chapter 8, there's a story of Philip. Philip uh, was the evangelist, as you know, from the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 8, it says very clearly in that passage of Scripture that the Spirit of God spoke to Philip and said, Arise, verse 26, go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. He arose and went. God gave him an assignment. Philip obeyed that assignment. God didn't tell him what he was going to do. See, this is the other part of our problem. We want to know the end from the beginning. That's not the way faith works, folks. Faith works step by step by step. You receive more light. You receive more direction. You receive more instruction as you take the next step in following Jesus Christ. If you have to know what's going to happen before you ever start, you will never start. That's what faith is all about. It's trusting God. Philip didn't know why he was going down there. God just said, get up and go. So he got up and went. Some of you need to get up and go. Come on, some of you need to get off your spiritual duff and do something for Jesus Christ. Get up and go. Be involved in the kingdom arena. He arose and went. And what happened? He met a man from Ethiopia. And this dude was reading the book of Isaiah. He had no understanding. He didn't know what he was talking about. And Philip said, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand? He said, how can I except someone explain it to me? So when he got there, he met the Ethiopian. Then suddenly his assignment became clear. Oh, come on, folks. When you start walking by faith, God clarifies things. Things come into focus. You begin to understand why I'm here and what I'm supposed to be doing. And then you begin to see what God's going to accomplish through you. So Philip explained the scriptures to him. I like it in verse 35. It says, then Philip opened his mouth, beginning at the scripture, and preached Jesus to him. Do you know why I love that worship this morning? Because it's all about Jesus. Oh, come on, folks. It's all about Jesus. If you can only say one thing, say Jesus to somebody, and then let that conversation unfold and see what happens as you begin to follow him. Notice... Philip didn't preach a Jewish Jesus to an Ethiopian. He preached Jesus to the Ethiopian. He didn't preach a a, a Jewish Jesus to a man who didn't understand, but rather he opened the scripture and taught him about who Jesus really was. You know the problem we have in Western Christianity? We try to bring everything through our culture and make it fit. We want everybody around the world to believe that you got to be just like me. You got to look like me, you got to smell like me, you got to dress like me, you got to act like me, you got to worship like me. That is not true. Jesus is not in uh, an item of Western culture. He's the God of all men in every situation. We need to understand that. I mean, if you try to tell somebody in the 1040 window who just came to Jesus, and brother, you know about it, they just came to Jesus, and you're going to tell them because you came to Jesus, look, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That just doesn't wash because somebody wants to cut their head off because they came to Jesus. What am I telling you? I'm telling you, you've got to present a Jesus that works in every culture, every language group, every ethnicity. A Jesus who redeems the soul, who saves mankind, who gives hope and promise for eternity. A Jesus who gives us a better tomorrow because we're living in his presence. We can't give them a Jesus who gives them stuff. If we give them a Jesus who gives them stuff, and they don't get any stuff, then how is that really the gospel? You see, it's not about, as we have often thought in Western culture, when I come to Jesus, I'm going to get a bigger house. I'm going to get a bigger car. I'm going to get a finer wardrobe. I'm going to get, 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 get. I'm going to have, 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 have. You see, the question isn't, what do you have? The question is, who has you? Who has you? Is it the trinkets you've gathered because you serve God that motivates you, inspire you? Or is it the fact that he has got a hold of your soul? He has squeezed that selfishness. He has squeezed that indifference. He has squeezed that apathy right out of you. And he's filled you with power from on high. And you are not the same person you were yesterday. Because what if he's doing inside of you? He preached Jesus Christ to him. Jesus Christ born of a virgin. Jesus living a sinless life. Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus rising again from the dead. Oh, come on, folks. That's what the world needs to hear. That's why Paul said in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Why is he ashamed? That's the question. Why did he say that? He answers it with the next phrase. Because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, Paul understood something. The gospel of salvation is not about what I can get. It's about who gets me. It's the power of God unto salvation. Do we understand that when we come to Christ, we are positioned? And because we are positioned, we receive power. What did the Bible say in Acts chapter 2? Jesus saying to the disciples, it's Acts chapter 1. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall receive power. That's right. The word is dunamos from the Greek. And it means an explosive power. A power that changes your life. It's dynamite in you. Listen, if you don't have some power at work in you, you need to say, what is it that I have and who is it that has me? Because that power transforms, that power changes, that power causes you to be a man or a woman of God. When you are infused with the Holy Spirit, that dunamis power begins to flow inside of you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the power of God and the salvation. Now listen to me. If you think that because you receive Christ, you have the answer to every question, you'll overcome every problem, you'll never encounter another enemy, you're all wrong. That's not true. But when you receive Christ and you receive that power of the Holy Spirit in your life, what you receive then is the ability to stand when things are ugly, to hold on when the diagnosis is bad, to believe God when the enemy is in your face. You don't fold. You don't crumble. You don't run. You don't bow down in fear. But you stand like a man or a woman of God with a backbone because you've been infused with the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody understand what I'm saying today. When you're positioned in Christ, he fills you with an assignment and power and anointing to complete that assignment. Anytime we try to culturalize the gospel, we alienate sinners. You tell the Native Americans that, oh, the gospel is all about what God's going to do for you. And you're a white man speaking that to them, and all they can see is all the treaties you have broken, all the lies your race has told them. It isn't going to wash. You better present a Jesus that can deal with addiction, that can deal with suffering, that can deal with abuse. You better present a, a Jesus that can reach down and touch their lives in a way they've never experienced before. Not some homogenized, Western culturalized gospel that doesn't have the power to blow the fuzz off a peanut. You better present a real Jesus. A real Jesus. You, you try presenting Jesus to an African American, and you tell them, hey, all you got to do is trust Jesus, and all that prejudice is going to be wiped away. Listen, prejudice isn't a matter of religion. It's a matter of sin. And until we understand that, we will always fight with it. We understand men are prejudiced against people who don't look like them, talk like them, act like them, because they're sinners. But when we come to Jesus Christ, oh, come on, Dr. D. When we come to Jesus, that cross makes us brothers and sisters. That cross levels the ground. That cross means that it doesn't matter the color of your skin. What matters is that you have Christ in your heart. And I can say to you, you're my sister in Christ. And I love you like I love that woman right over there. That's what God does for us. It's only the power of Jesus' name that can break that thing and set us free. Come on, church. That's the message we need to be sharing. Don't, don't continue, and I'm talking to everybody in this room, it doesn't matter the color of your skin or your ethnicity. Don't continue in the ways of the world that lead us to division and strife and anger, but stand in your position, move in your authority, and let the love of God flow through your life to touch somebody who doesn't look like you. See what God can do through you when you stand up. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I do want to ask you a very penetrating question. How many in this room can honestly say, I've missed my assignment? I knew what I was supposed to do, and I didn't do it. I didn't do it because I was afraid, or I didn't do it because of the sacrifice involved, or I didn't do it because my spouse, or I didn't do it because my parents, or I didn't do it because I had children. We have a multitude of excuses for why we fail in our assignments. We don't want our community disrupted. We don't want to lose our seat in church. 
Do you realize that years ago I was a pastoring a church and it exploded and began to grow? And there was a sweet little old lady by the name of Maxine, and she sat four pews back, three seats in, and she piled the pew beside her with her, with her coat and with her Bibles and everything else she could put on it. And when pe- the church began to grow and someone needed that seat, she refused to give it up. And I said, why are you not giving that up? She said, because that's where my dead husband sat. Well, he's dead. Let it go. Let somebody see life. Come on. You get what I'm saying? We refuse to allow our community to be disrupted, our lifestyle to be challenged. But Jesus has positioned you so that you can make a difference in this world. So that you can bring change into somebody's life. You are Jesus with skin on today. So let him use you. Stand in your assignment. Be in that place of authority. You see, because if you have good news... And you don't share it. You don't do well. So I don't know where you're getting that from, preacher. Look at 2 Kings. You'll find the story is right there in chapter 7. The story is that of Samaria being besieged. And the city is shut up and the people are starving to death. And there's four lepers outside the city gates. And when everybody is about to die inside the city and they're about to die from starvation, they finally wake up one day and think, maybe we should do something different. Now listen, there's a scriptural principle there. If what you're doing isn't working, maybe you should do something different. If what you're trying isn't accomplishing God's purposes, maybe you need to do something different. I don't know who that's for, but you need to put it in your pipe and smoke it today and let it digest in you until you understand, i got to change. Something's got to give. So God can do what he wants to do in my life. Those four old guys were sitting outside the city gates. And one day they just woke up and said, you know, we need to take a risk. Somebody in this room needs to take a risk. You need to get out of that comfort zone and take a risk. You're so comfortable in your place of starvation, you're not even thinking about moving. They said, we need to take a risk. If we go into the city, we're going to die because they're all dying. If we sit where we're at, we're going to die. But if we go to the enemy's camp, who knows? But what, they'll have mercy on us and give us something to eat. Let's take a risk. Oh, folks, there's always a risk when you step into your assignment and you say, I'm going to do what God's asking me to do. There's always a risk involved. When Gary Bird said, I'm going to leave my church in in Amarillo, where I've pastored for 40 years, and I'm going to start a ministry to the least, the last, and the lost, God said, you're taking some risks. You're walking away from a salary and security. Oh, come on, folks. I'm telling you, it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to stop sitting where we have been for years, to stand up in our assignment, to take some risks and see what God will do. You know, when we challenged this whole mortgage situation a year and a half ago, someone said to me, well, what if they don't do what they're supposed to do and they come and take the building? My position, let them have it. You got to take a risk. Come on, folks, if you are willing to see, if you want to see God move in your life, you've got to get out of that same place of comfort that you're dying in and take a risk. Let God do something in your life. So these four lepers said, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we go in the city, we're going to die because there's no food there. But maybe, just maybe, if we go down to the enemy's camp, maybe they'll have mercy on us and give us something to eat and we'll live. So they went down to the enemy's camp. And when they got there, God had made the enemy think there was another army coming against him. And they just got up and left. They fled in fear. They left everything. And they found food. They found gold. They found jewelry. They found clothes. They found everything they didn't have when they took a risk. Now listen to the application. I'm not telling you you're going to find all things in the physical. But I'm telling you, if you'll stand up and move out and take a risk, you will find the windows of heaven open. And God will download something into your spirit that will change you forevermore. We are so focused on right now, that we fail to understand how good, how wonderful, how powerful our God really is. Oh, He wants to fill you with dunamis power. He wants to encourage you to step out and take that risk. And then you know what He does? He takes you by the hand and leads you. Oh, you're not alone. You're not by yourself. He's on your side when you say, I'm going to follow Him. Those four guys found all that stuff. 
Read the scriptures there in 2 Kings 7. They carried it off and they hid it. They took care of themselves. But then in verse 9, I'm going to put verse, it's on the screen. Wonderful, thank you. They said to one another, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news. And we're remaining. If we wait until morning light, something bad's going to happen to us. Listen to me. If you receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you have been saved through the blood of Christ, if you've came to Calvary and He changed your life, you're not doing right if you don't tell somebody about what you have. Come on, God called you to be a witness. You know, too many times in the church, we like to come in, hold hands and sing Kumbaya because we're here to worship. Oh, we are here to worship God. But you know, the greatest expression of our worship is when we show our worship through service to someone else. When we put legs on our worship and hands on our worship and a voice to our worship and minister and serve someone who's hurting and lost and needs to know Jesus Christ. I pray every day, God, don't ever let me forget where you brought me from. Because the moment I forget where you brought me from is the moment I become self-serving and self-involved. Don't ever let me forget that you redeemed me, you ransomed me, you pulled my feet out of the miry clay, and you set my feet on the rock to stay, because that becomes motivation to worship the King of Kings through assignment, with authority. They said, we're not doing right if we be still. Now, can I tell you something? The church is filled with folks not doing right because we don't open our mouth to tell anybody about Jesus. You know what happens? That gift God given, gives us begins to shrink up within us, begins to dry up. We become like old Maxine. We want to save a seat for her dead husband. May as well, you're dead anyway. Why not? Love the way you're shouting now. Come on, we need to understand that if we don't allow the Spirit of God to flow through our lives, He stops flowing. If we don't allow Him to move through us, He steps away. So many believers are in that position where they have dried up, they have shrunk up. They're like an old prune. They're full of self-pity. They're full of envy and jealousy. Why do you think we have so many churches in Tallahassee that run less than 20? Because somebody got their panties in a wad and got mad and they went and started their own thing and nobody wants to be a part of it. Amen. We've got to understand God wants us to flow in the Spirit of God in our position. Oh, but you don't understand. He did me wrong. He harmed me. I was insulted. I was injured. I have one question for you. Did they pull the whiskers out of your face and beat you to a bloody pulp? Did they hang you on a cross with common thieves? Did they drive nails through your wrists and through your ankles? Did they stick a spear in your side to make sure they finished you off? See, because until you can tell me that's what happened to me, you have no right to complain. All you have a right to do is surrender to the presence of the king who suffered all of that for you so that you can be in position and walk in authority and see God do mighty things in and through your lives. See God move in you. See, we understand that when we're in position, I can give a cup of cold water in his name. And it has eternal effects. I can feed the hungry in his name and it has eternal effects. I can show compassion. I love that video that Sadie put together. Thank you, Sadie. That was wonderful. I love that statement about we can do nothing or we can show compassion. Folks, that's really our only two choices. We can do nothing or we can show compassion. Why are we collecting diapers and wipes? Because there's little teenage moms in a home in Falcon, North Carolina that have been given a place where they can come in and stay until the baby is born. And after the baby is born, they don't kick them out, but rather they let them stay. They teach them. They educate them. They train them. They give them parenting skills. They prepare them for life. Oh, come on, folks. It's time to understand. Either we ignore it or we're we're moved with compassion because of it. And when we're moved with compassion, God does something in us. We need to understand that when we choose to be in position and assignment, God flows through us, and we may never see the end result of what has been accomplished. 
Brother Collins, I guarantee you, you'll never see the result of all those kids in Africa that you led to Jesus Christ. But right now, some of them are growing up, and they're becoming leaders in the church, and they are mountain movers, and they will go into other parts of Africa outside of Kenya, and God will use them to build the kingdom of God. You may never see it, but God sees it. Oh, come on, church. Quit st- Stop worrying about the result and start worrying about the action that brings results. Let God do something in you and through you. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36, Jesus said, If you abide in my word, I want to read that scripture for you. It's powerful. I want you to hear it this morning. John chapter 8, 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we've got to focus on the truth. The truth is, church doesn't change many people. That's the truth. The truth is, religion changes nobody. That's the truth. The truth is, my actions are minimal outside of the anointing, the unction, the power of the Holy Ghost. But the truth is also this, when I preach Jesus, when I tell tell someone about Jesus, when I show His love, His grace, His mercy, His compassion, then the truth will set somebody free. Because the truth isn't me or my word, the truth is one whose name is Jesus. Oh, say say the name! Say the name! Say the name! Say the name of Jesus. Say the name of Jesus. And let him move in and through your life. Come on, folks. Step out of that place of comfort. Step into your assignment. Be faithful. Be dependable. And let Jesus shine through you. And when you do, you're going to understand and see things in a way you've never thought possible or in a way you never imagined. You'll see people coming to you that you've never known before. You know, when I was on the Hoka, hey, I've told you about the experiences I had. They all happened because I got sick and had to go to the hospital and rode the rest of the way by myself. But I never would have met Billy in North Georgia and led him to the Lord except God ordained that meeting. I never would have met Lily in Montana except God ordained that meeting. I never would have met David except God ordained that meeting. I never would have met Julie at that gas station with the bruises on her face and the tears running down her cheeks except Jesus ordained that moment. And you know what? I didn't say, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus to any of them? But I talked to them about their life. And that opens the door to say the name. Say the name. Say the name. Say the name. Come on, there's power in the name of Jesus. There is liberty in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. The truth shall set men free. When we begin to understand that. You know, the word in the scripture is continue or abide. If you continue in my word, or if you abide in my word. The Greek is menos. And you know what that means? It literally means to stay in a given place, a given relationship, This is the one I really like. Or a given expectancy. A given expectancy. You see, I'm convinced that when I step out into the fields that are white unto harvest, and I plunge in the sickle, I have every right to believe for a harvest. That's an expectancy that's going to live within me. I'm not laboring in vain. I'm laboring with the Master. And the Master always brings a harvest into our lives. Now, it may not look what we think it should look like. It may be completely different, but when we choose to stay in position, when we choose to abide in His Word, and His Word abides in us, when we have been set free by the truth, then that same truth should flow through us to touch somebody else's life. Have you missed your assignment? Have you stepped out of your assignment? How long has it been since you said the name of Jesus to someone that was hurting, to someone that was in a quandary, to someone who had no answers? How long has it been? You say, well, I just don't know how to do that. Well, come and walk with me for a few days, and I'll show you how. Because the opportunities are abundant. The problem is we close our eyes. You know, it's so easy to get get focused on simply being the pastor of Christian Heritage Church that I ignore the harvest that's out there. God challenges me every day. Who are you going to talk to today? Who are you going to sow into today? Who are you going to minister today? What truth will you speak into somebody's life today? Folks, that's my challenge to you. Don't tell them I go to church. Tell them about Jesus. Most of the world's sick at church already. 
All they've seen is hypocrisy, divisions, and strife, and fighting. Give them some good news. Be like those four lepers. If we don't go into the city and tell them what we found, we're not doing well. We're not doing right. Listen, folks, if we don't tell somebody about what we have found, or let me rephrase that, who has found us, we're not doing right. Find a way to say that name. Find a way to bring people unto you. And then I'm going to wrap it up with this one. We're not finished with the outline yet, and it may be three more weeks. Who knows? Anyway, it makes my life easier when I don't have to write a new outline, right? When we understand we are positioned, we are in assignment, we're living under authority from the King of Kings, when His power flows through our lives so that we can touch those around us, when we understand that, then we never quit. We never quit. Quitting should not be a part of the Christian's vocabulary. God God didn't call you to quit. God called you to finish. God called you to move on. God called you to finish. It doesn't matter how rough it is. He didn't call you to quit. He called you to continue. That's why Paul wrote it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. What did he talk about? He's talking about the fact that my life is coming to a close. Any day they're going to take my head from my body. But this is what I want you to know. I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. I don't know about you, but when I stand before the Lord of the universe, I want to be able to look him in the eye and say, I didn't quit. I didn't give up. I didn't throw in the towel, but I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I completed the race. I will not give up. I will not give in because I am positioned with authority and assignment. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, in this room today, you know the individuals who need to be touched by you. They need to come to your son and receive a saving, redeeming power. They need what we have. They need that peace, that hope, that comfort, that forgiveness that only you can offer. I pray for them right now. I pray that now they make the best decision they've ever made in the entirety of their life. The decision to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. To let you forgive them of their sins. And to change them for all of eternity. I've just prayed for you. I just prayed for you. Now you need to respond to God. Holy Spirit has been talking to you for an hour, drawing you, showing you that there's something missing in your life that you will never satisfy. You will never be able to complete. What you're missing is forgiveness that comes only from Jesus Christ. Radical transformation that he brings to you and me. That's you, right where you're sitting this morning. You say, wow, you just talked to me right now. And you prayed for me. I want to respond to God. Slip your hand up right where you're set. I'm going to wait just a moment. Yes, ma'am. Someone else. Slip your hand up right where you're sitting. Yes, sir. Someone else. There are others in the room. God's talking to you. Just slip up that hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Someone else. Holy Spirit's working in your heart right now. Don't resist Him. Submit to Him. Yield to Him. By lifting the hand, you're saying, I need what Jesus offers. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Across this room, stand to your feet with me. Every one of you who raised your hand right now, without hesitation, without uh, thinking about it, step out and come. We're going to pray, and what you need, you'll receive. Step out and come right now. Come on. From across the, every part of the sanctuary, step out and come right now. You raise your hand. That was you. Step out and come this morning. Don't wait for anybody else. This is your day. This is your time. This is your hour to meet the God of the universe and to let Him transform your life. Come on. Step out and come. From every section, from every area, step out and come. That's it. Come on. Others, come on. Pastor David, are you there? Come on down and be ready. Pastor David, please come on down and be ready. 
I want you to, elders and deacons here on the front, Yvonne, Daniel, Jessica, step out. Lay your hands on these individuals. I want you to pray with them personally and individually. I want you to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. After you've prayed, David is going to take them to 103. He's going to give them that assurance of what God's doing in their life and help them connect to the body of Christ. Right now, would you just stretch your hands out and let's pray for these individuals. Father, right now, we pray for a revelation of your grace a revelation of your mercy. We pray that each individual in this line this morning would come to know and understand that God loves them, God cares for them, God wants to forgive them, deliver them, transform them, and change them. God, I pray that this not be a simple little prayer that's quickly forgotten, but there be a deep work of the Spirit of God at work in their lives right now. God, I pray that every sin be washed away as we say the name, as we say the name, as we confess our sin to Jesus, cleanse us from that sin. Make us the time of men and women you want us to be right now. Change hearts, O oh God. Bring transformation, O oh God. Change these men and women. Make them sons and daughters of the Most High right now. Forgive them and cleanse them. Wash their sins away. Let the blood of Jesus Christ flow effectively and powerfully in their lives today. Do your work deep within them, I pray. Deep within them, I pray. Do the works of God. Accomplish the works of God. Minister life into them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, save and transform these men. Save and transform these men. Save and transform these men. Do a work within them, Father. Do a work within them. Do a work deep within them, I pray. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. Those of you that are praying with them, please feel free to continue to pray with them. David's right over here. Would you just turn and follow David? He's going to take you out to 103. You're going to pray with you personally, and God's going to do a work in your life. So just follow David and let him uh, lead you to that place of assurance and knowledge what God's done in your life this morning. Secondly, you're here today, and you say, Pastor, I've blown my assignment. I know it, but I'm done with that. I want to get back where God has positioned me to be, do what God has called me to do, live in the authority that God has in place for me. I want to change today and be the kind of believer that changes my world. That's you. Just step out and come. We're going to pray together. Come on, don't wait for anybody else. Just step out and come. That's you this morning. Step out and come. God's going to do a work in your life as we pray together this morning. Step out and come. Join these who are responding. God wants to do something in you today. He wants to position you for your assignment. Step out and come. Our prayer is that God will take this word and plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. Father, we pray for your great wisdom to infiltrate this listener, draw them to you, and take them gently down the road to their next destination in life. And if you're in need of a home church, we invite you to join us at Christian Heritage Church on Shera Road in Tallahassee, Florida, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. For a worship service where the presence of God has first place, You're invited to Christian Heritage Church. Sunday morning service is at 1030, Wednesday evening at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For all the latest information, visit our website, chctoday.com.